Um, the apologies that the, uh, <laughs> the short video for uh, the second half of Friday's lecture actually wound up being the length of a full lecture. As I mentioned on there, um, in the future, I made notes to re restructure the syllabus just to make sure they have that full time there. Um, make sure you watch that panopto. It is relevant to the homework that's due on Friday. Um, so, in fact, the homework on Friday basically takes, that's due on Friday, takes the information up through that lecture, the second half of Friday's lecture. Uh, the stuff I'm talking about now really plays in for the homework the following week uh, where we look at geology, because that's what we're doing. We're now moving into a section of the course where we're going to look at the fundamentals of geology that we need to know in order to understand the science of dinosaurs. So we're going to start with the basics. What are rocks? How do they form? Yes? Just a question about the homework. So each Friday's homework, the, like based on what was learned the week before? Typically, yes. Typically. Um, so we're going to be uh, looking at uh, a little of the introduction to geology because rocks, that is the stuff we study in geology, are the records of ancient environments. So that's important. They are keepers of geologic time, and they're evidence of past life in the form of the fossils within them. So we're going to look first today about how rocks, and specifically sedimentary rocks in particular, how they form. Then we'll move on to look at how fossils form. Next week, we'll look at geologic time, at excavating fossils, and then we'll transition from the physical environment to the biological environment by looking at uh, systems in, uh, in the life and earth sciences. OK, so three big key features there. And so it's important to know your geology in order to understand think, fossil organisms like dinosaurs, because the secret to finding fossils is to go where they are, and they're in rocks. And when you look under your feet, the past is there. Uh, or as uh, Ray Troll, who is the artist who did the last page on this one as well, um, has every road cut asks a question. Um, you just have to learn how to read it. And speaking of reading, people sometimes refer to uh, rocks as the pages of the Book of Time. And next week, we'll look at how those pages are interpreted, how, how we read the time in it. But today, we're going to look at how those pages themselves are written. Now, the rocks don't lie. Uh, <laughs> they don't have the option. Uh, but the trick is we have to figure out how to understand what they're saying. So let's start at the beginning. This is a science course, indeed, in any academic course. Uh, words have meanings. Meanings means definitions. We need a definition. So although all of us have you know, looked at rocks since we were tiny little kids, uh, you may not have thought about what is the definition of a rock before. So here we go. Rocks are naturally occurring cohesive solids comprised of one or more minerals or mineraloids. OK, let's take that step by step. Naturally occurring. So typically, we distinguish rocks from the things that we humans generate as part of our technology. Remember the nose. The nose is included in the mask. There we go. Um, so naturally occurring. Cohesive solids, so not merely solid, rather than gaseous, or liquid, or uh, plasma, but cohesive. You can pick it up and shake it around a little bit before it falls apart. So a pile of sand is not rock, but a sandstone is. It is a cohesive solid. And comprised of one or more minerals or mineraloids, what does that mean? It doesn't matter for this class. It's just part of the definition. But I know if I say that, and you go, oh my god, what is, you know, I saw a definition, but I don't know what it is. A mineral is something that has a regular crystalline structure, and a mineraloid doesn't necessarily. OK. So that's the definition of rocks. But what, you know, we need to go a little beyond that. And we're going to look at the classification of rocks. And the basic way we classify rocks is genetic. Not by DNA, but genetic in the pure sense of the term, by origin. The different rock types are classified ultimately as a reflection of how they formed. And there's a mantra in geology that every rock is a record 
of the environment in which it formed. And therefore, once we, you know, when you find a rock, you can interpret what the ancient environment was. Now, when I'm using environment here, I'm using it in the broad geological sense. Not necessarily the sort of environment that people in the environmental studies programs here on campus would study, or that the EPA protects, the Environmental Protection Agency. In part, some of those would be the same. There are rocks that form on in streams, or lakes, or deserts, or beaches, or reefs, or the deep sea floor, or whatever. And we think of those as environments. But environments also include the roots underneath a mountain. You may not have known that. Mountains have roots. Not, not little, you know, not little or huge things sticking out from them, but there's a big projection down, that's a much larger projection down than there is the stuff sticking up that forms a mountain. Or inside a body of magma as it's cooling. That's an environment in geology, but it's not an environment in terms of, uh, you know, the way we think of environments typically, and so forth. So every rock is a record of the environment in which it was formed. Now, most of you know, you know, from the time you were in grade school, that there are three types of rock. Okay, no. uh, that there are three types of rock. But a really a better way of saying it is there are three pathways to get to that cohesive solid. And in fact, they, it doesn't just happen once. Any solid mass of material can be subjected to these pathways again and be transformed into a different rock. So the three major pathways reflected here are melting and cooling, uh, recrystallization through heat and pressure, or breaking it apart and redepositing it. And those are reflected in the three major rock types. Uh, or here is the understandably less popular geology version of rock, paper, scissors, rock, rock, rock. And in fact, the, um, the artist who did this, who, oh my goodness, I can say this now, the newly minted Dr. Nate Carroll, uh, he passed his uh, PhD defense uh, like a couple weeks ago, um, did this as an undergraduate when he was at Montana State University. And each of, these, each of these guys was an expert in that particular field of rock. So, you know, a sedimentologist, a metamorphic geologist, and an igneous petrologist. Okay, so we'll start with igneous rocks. The IGN in igneous is exactly the same as the IGN in ignite, to burn, fire. So these are rocks formed by fire, or rather more broadly by heat. So the pathway to get to igneous rocks is these are ones that are formed by the cooling from molten magma, if it's underground, if that happens to come out onto the surface, we call it lava, same stuff, just different environments. So we went from a liquid state, a molten state, which cools down and crystallizes. That's how we get an igneous rock. For instance, this granite that you see in the background. So, yeah, if it cools underground, that's a different sort of environment than on the surface, and the rocks they form will be different. So, igneous rocks that form on the surface, we call volcanic igneous rocks. Uh, because, well, they come out of volcanoes. And not, not all volcanoes are these nice cones that are erupting liquid material like that. Sometimes there are rifts and so forth. But you've got a sense of what volcanoes are like. Uh, so at the time that this picture was taken, these aren't rock. This is not rock yet, because it's still liquid. But the black, crusty surface here, those would have been the very youngest rocks on the face of the Earth at that time, because they had just cooled from a molten state. They were now solid. They were now naturally occurring cohesive solids, comprised of one or more minerals or mineraloids. We can also refer to these type of rocks as extrusive igneous rocks. They are extruded onto the surface or erupted onto the surface. Now, if you think about it, in order to melt rock, you can't just like, throw rocks in your oven at home and crank it up and melt rocks. That's not hot enough. So these things are hundreds of degrees centigrade, if not you know, in the low 1,000-something you know, degrees centigrade. Incredibly hot. But when they cool down, they're rocks. So at the time I took this picture, this lava flow was about just about 100 years old. 
However, the vast majority of igneous rocks form at depth. And the god of the underworld in Roman mythology was Pluto, so these are Plutonic igneous rocks. They form at depth. So in this photograph, the pink rock, that was the Plutonic igneous rock. And it has intruded, it melted into the previously existing native rock of that area, the grayish stuff. So we can refer to Plutonic igneous rocks as intrusive igneous rocks. They melt or inject their way into previously existing rocks and then cool at depth. And so because they cool at depth, just as an aside, they're, they're pretty well thermally insulated. It takes a long time for them to cool. And because of that, the crystals in them grow quite large, and they actually look really pretty. Not the critical aspect in terms of geology, but, you know, we should have a sense of aesthetics here. Um, so plutonic igneous rocks may form at depth, but because the surface of the Earth is subjected to buckling and compression and uplift and erosion by, in this case, the Wind River cutting down through this mountain range, um, we can see stuff that was once deep underground now exposed at the surface. You know, here's another place where a sheet of dark igneous rock here has intruded into a series of other rocks around it. Now, igneous rocks are way too hot, as I mentioned, when they form in order to contain fossils, the remains of once living things. If you put an organic put an organism into a molten mass, it would burn up and incinerate before it could leave any sort of significant fossils. So we don't find fossils in igneous rocks. But we will see, when we talk about geologic time, that in some cases, and the example on the screen right here, igneous rocks are going to be really helpful in reading geologic time. Okay, that's one pathway, cooling from a molten state. Another pathway, recrystallization. So that's where you take previously existing rocks, technically called protoliths, so ancestral rock, and you subject it to incredible heat and or pressure, and it recrystallizes that. What do I mean? Well, the original crystals had one particular set of bonds between the individual atoms that it made up. Recrystallization means that those bonds break and a new set of bonds happen among that set of atoms. So you're not you're, we're not undergoing fusion. We're not changing the elements represented. But we're changing the arrangements between the individual atoms to form new crystals. Now, the environments that these represent are not typical ones that we see in the surface of the Earth. You know, whereas in a volcano you can picture, you wouldn't want to be too close to it, but you can picture that. And I think a lot of us can picture the conditions under which uh, plutonic igneous rocks could form. We can, we can picture a big molten mass deep underground that's cooling. This is sort of weird. So to think of regions where you're undergoing great pressure, compression. Now, the best example I can think of this uh, is not a, uh, not a real world example, but a fictional one. And that, huh, running out of juice here, let's see, is Superman. So, Superman takes a previously existing rock a piece of coal, and incredible pressure, Kryptonian muscles, and incredible heat, heat ray vision, he takes it and converts the piece of coal into a diamond. And so what's going on here, he's not adding material to it, he's not removing material from it, but because he's changed the pressure temperature condition, the bonds between those carbon atoms change into a new state, that of a diamond. The real places that this would occur would be at great depth or in fields, in regions, where you're getting a lot of compression going on. And these produce metamorphic rocks. And so the pathway to metamorphism, previously existing rocks, protoliths, get recrystallized by the effects of intense heat and or pressure. 
Now, if you think about it, if you are generating, if you, if nature is generating sufficient heat and or pressure to form new, to break the old bonds and form new bonds between the individual atoms, then if there were a fossil that existed in the protolith, it's probably not going to survive in a recognizable state. Because that act of the redistribution of the bonds is probably going to smear it out or even obliterate it. So we don't find fossils in metamorphic rocks. And they're not super useful in telling geologic time. And because of that, other than the occasional homework or exam, that's going to be it for metamorphic rocks in this class. But then they're the good sort. Then they're the rocks that we're going to concentrate on. Okay, from my point of view, they're the good rocks. The pathway here to produce them is uplift, erosion, transport, and deposition. So previously existing rocks of any sort get pushed up by tectonics, by mountain building. We'll talk in a, couple, in a, a week, a week from Friday. Uh, about tectonics of it. So old existing rocks get pushed up. They get subjected to erosion. They get weathered by you know, rain coming down, by, uh, by snow, by ice, by the action of lichens and plants, by gravity. You, know, you push it up, it tends to break apart and fall down. And then this assorted bits and pieces of previously existing rock get transported. They get transported by liquid water in the form of things like streams, by wind, and in the right parts of the world, they can get transported by ice, by glaciers, as they push them around. But they don't stay moving continuously. Eventually, they settle down, so they deposit somewhere. Maybe they deposit on the surface of the land, Maybe they deposit somewhere in water. So uplift, erosion, transport, and deposition. And this is the way we get to sedimentary rocks. So sedimentary rocks form by deposition of transported fragments of previously existing rocks. And since igneous rocks are not ones that have fossils, and metamorphic rocks that have fossils, I think you can see where we're going to be going. These are the ones that are going to have fossils in them, so we're going to spend a little more time understanding sedimentary rocks. So each little bit of a sedimentary rock was once some other rock that was then broken apart, transported, and redeposited. And they are our clue to past life, in the form of fossils, and they are the most immediate clue for many aspects of geologic time, as we'll see next week. Now, within sedimentary rocks, there are sort of three major ways they form. The classic one, the one that most of us think about when we think about sedimentary rocks, if you think about sedimentary rocks, are what we call detrital, or sometimes clastic, or siliciclastic, but detrital is the word I'm going to typically use. Sedimentary rocks, so detrital, you know, detritus is trash, basically. Um, and in this case, the particles of the previously existing rocks are transported as solids. They're transported as solid chunks, as tiny little rocks themselves. So let's say over here, those are the original, original source rocks, they got pushed up. Erosion does its thing, breaks it up into fragments, and those fragments get transported along as cobbles and pebbles and sand and silt and mud and then get deposited as solids. So those are detrital sedimentary rocks. But the chemical aspects of erosion, particularly water, will dissolve some of those previous minerals and break them down into individual ions, you know, uh, dissolved salts basically. And then they get transported chemically in liquid solution, in water solution. And it might be that some of those ions get picked up by a living thing, by a clam, by a coral, by a plant. And then it's used to build the body of those organisms, 
which then themselves die and their body parts accumulate to form the rock. We call that type of pathway the biogenic, the made by life. Or, in some cases, those, those uh, ions in, in water solution make their way to some basin, some lake or, or lagoon, or sh uh, shore environment, and the water evaporates or at least gets uh, hyper-concentrated in those ions, and then they crystallize out as salt, which accumulates on the lake floor or the sea floor. That pathway forms chemical sedimentary rocks. So detrital, biogenic, and chemical sedimentary rocks. Okay. Because sedimentary rocks are deposited, so, you know, they're chunks that, are, that have been moving along, or they're ions that are moving, moving along, then they settle down, they're depositing, they naturally form flat layers called strata, or if you're British, strata. Singular is stratum, but we rarely use the singular. Um, so we have lots of strata down here. If you ever get to the... Um, the Bright Angel Trail of the uh, Grand Canyon. This photograph I took right now, so lots of strata down here. And then one big stratum right here. And that's going to be really critical in, in understanding the sequence of events in geologic time. In fact, that process is called stratigraphy. We'll see it next Wednesday. But let's take a look at some of these in a little more detail. One famous sort, an important sort of biogenic sedimentary rock, is coal. Coal represents the accumulated bodies of plant matter. So, and it indicates an environment in which there's a lot of plant growth, and the plants get buried faster than they could decay. If they got decayed, they would be broken up into individual ions, redistributed, you wouldn't have a mass there. But if enough of that stuff accumulates and then gets compressed down, it squeezes out a lot of the other stuff and it concentrates that organic matter into what we call coal. So it's a biogenic sedimentary rock. The rock itself was also once a living thing. And so right here we see this is a mudstone, so a detrital sedimentary rock. But right here, this seam here is coal. And it indicates at this spot that there was a lot of plant growth and that the plants got buried faster than they could decay. Another major sort of biogenic sedimentary rock are in the general category of carbonates. The most famous type of carbonate is limestone. Limestone is made up of the broken up bits of the shells of organisms. It's extremely common for organisms to produce shells that are made of calcium carbonate. So clams and snails, corals, and many plankton, many types of organisms produce bodies, shells at least, of calcium carbonate. So sometimes those accumulate down and they make the rock themselves. Other times you can actually have carbonates which are chemical sedimentary rocks. Those shells dissolve, but then that calcium carbonate re-precipitates and settles down. Now, this happens in the water. It typically indicates warm and salty water, but that could go from a shallow beach, well, the beaches have to be shallow because they're at sea level, all the way down to ocean depths. But there are also lakes in which carbonates can form. So right here, this is up in the Appalachian Mountains, but these, this was once a reef deposit, not a coral reef, but a sponge reef, that made its body parts out of calcium carbonate. And here, this was a beach, as a series of beach deposits in Portugal. And at the time that they were forming, dinosaurs were walking along them. And I think you might be able to see the hint of these paired trails of sort of oval shapes. Those are the footprints of giant long necked dinosaurs that were walking on a nice white carbonate beach. Carbonate beaches, think of places like the Bahamas or many of the beaches of the Caribbean. That sort of whitish sand there. That sand isn't quartz like a lot of beach sand would be. It's the broken up fragments of shells. 
One particularly important sort of limestone is chalk. Back in the day, when this was a blackboard and not a whiteboard, I would say a particular type of rock called, and you'd think I was going to write something, I could pull it around for chalk, but I can't do that anymore. So. Um, chalk is a type of limestone that's made from the skeletons of a single-celled algae. So these are the white cliffs of Dover. Why are they white? Because they're made of chalk. They form in very warm waters, and indeed they characterize a particular part of Earth history. When chalk was so common that we call that age, or technically period, the chalk, only it sounds better in Latin, Cretaceous. We'll get to that story in a bit. This is what one of these organisms looked like, or at least its skeleton. And so there'd be a single spherical cell, and within its, its um, cytoplasm, it formed little plates that, to me, remind me of like little hubcaps. These are microscopic. In fact, these are, are, are extremely small. You need scanning electron microscopes to see them clearly. When the organism dies out in nature, the cytoplasm dissolves away, the individual plates then accumulate on the seafloor, and this is what chalk looks like under a scanning electron microscope. Exactly the same composition as normal limestone, but because it's made of these tiny, tiny, tiny little flat fragments, that's why you can take a piece of chalk and draw on a chalkboard, and it doesn't sound horrible. Whereas if I took a chunk of limestone made of exactly the same comp composition, but not made of those little plates, and I tried to draw on it, we'd all be screaming from the shrieking sound that it's making. So, chalk. Chemical sedimentary rocks, you know, other than the chemical carbonates that I mentioned before, the major or other sort, we have our rock salt, or what we call evaporites, formed by, not surprisingly, evaporation. So we have a, a restricted basin of water. It might be a lake, it might be a lagoon, where you have enough evaporation going on that the water gets super concentrated in those salts, some of them crystallize out and settle down onto the lake or sea floor. And so they indicate an arid environment, a spot with high rates of evaporation. So if it was a lake, it would be a lake in the middle of a desert. If it were a coastline, it would tell you it's a coastline and probably a desert region. We can find evaporites forming today, for instance, in the American Southwest or in the Mexican Southwest. We can also find them in places like along the Persian Gulf. So I think both those places typically rather deserty. Well, let's concentrate though on the tribal sedimentary rocks, the ones that are transported as solids, because that's where our dinosaur fossils are going to be. I've already done this graph if you've seen it before. Our classification of the tribal sedimentary rocks starts basically with the size of the major particles of sediment. So again, sediment to be broken up bits of rock transported as solids. There is a technical way of breaking down these particles based on the average par particle size of the, the main class or fragments in there. And it's, it's numerical, but we use English words to describe them. So large ones are called gravel, and you can see under this scheme, gravel is subdivided into things like boulders and cobbles and pebbles and granules. Don't worry about that distinction in this class. Then smaller than that is sand. And sand, you can see, goes from very coarse to very fine. If it is smaller than you can easily see with the naked eye, but you could see it with a hand lens, then it's silt. And if it's too small, the individual particles are too small to see with even a hand lens, we call it clay. So gravel, sand, silt, clay. Collectively, silt and clay, mud. Really creative. OK, now we are super creative. What do we call a rock made out of clay? Clay stone. What do we call a rock made out of silt? Silt stone. What do we call a rock made out of sand? Sandstone. What do we call a rock made out of gravel? We don't call it gravel stone. Don't blame me. It's not my fault. It should be. <laughs> But, you know, generations of, of geologists, in English at least, we don't call it gravel stone. Instead, we refer to breccias. Those, it's from an Italian word, the thing broken, breccia. That has really angular fragments. 
and a conglomerate if they're rounded fragments. Because the rounding or angular will tell us something about their history. And what these things do, these sizes of the particles, they tell us about the energy of the environment in which they were deposited. Now, when it started, when you had your host rock here and it was breaking apart, all particle size were being formed. Huge boulders bigger than a human being down to tiny little fragments as they're getting uh, accumulated there. And as you transport it in a bit, depending on the energy and the environment, you might drop stuff off or carry stuff along. So this was a debris flow. So that's my rock hammer. That's part of my hand. Um, you can see these very large particles there. This tells us that the energy of this environment was very fast, was very, was very high. Think white water, because that's what it would have been. Really fast moving stuff, stuff the size of sand and silt and mud. It's just going to get washed along unless it happens to get trapped between some of the larger chunks. But otherwise, it just washes along. And even the larger particles are being rolled along, but the main thing that's accumulating there are these big particles. Then think about a beach. A beach, or think of inside a river channel, it's not really fast enough to roll big particles around. They pretty much stay in place. But the sand gets rolled along and washed back and forth. So that's sort of an intermediate level. Sandstone reflects sort of an intermediate level. And if the energy is extremely low, we call very quiet environment, you can't even move sand. So that sand's all been dropped off somewhere else. And only the very finest, the very smallest particles are transported and accumulate there. So this, with this extremely small part, you can't even see the particles here. There's a little slab of a of clay stone here. Um, the very low energy environment uh, means that only the very finest particles were settling there. Now, at any given moment, any spot on the surface of the Earth is in one of two conditions. Either it's in what we call E-world, a world dominated by erosion, or it's in D-world, a world dominated by deposition. In E-world, stuff is disappearing. In D-world, it's piling up. You need to have both. Without erosion, you can't have sediment to deposit somewhere else. But it means that some of the history of the Earth is always continuously being destroyed as it's eroding away, as old material gets lost. But it also means a new history is being generated somewhere else. So E-world and D-world. So a mountain range is typically E-world. It's been pushed up by tectonic forces, wind and rain and snow and gravity and plants are breaking it apart slowly but surely. We're getting landslides as the dramatic form, or avalanches, the super dramatic forms, uh, but also just bit by bit, parts of it are being torn away and transported somewhere else. Mountains might look to us as if they are eternal, but they are ephemeral. Nature just grinds them down and redistributes it. Other spots that are in E-world, some parts of, the de of deserts, the winds are strong enough, it tends to remove stuff and only leave the largest particles behind. Or a rocky cliff face, or any cliff face. A cliff face, by definition, is an E-world, because you're eroding stuff away, that's why there's a cliff there. But thankfully, of course, not everything's in E-world, otherwise we wouldn't have a sedimentary rock record, and therefore no fossils. So detrital sedimentary rocks, we can interpret aspects of their depositional environment, the place the stuff gets uh, deposited. So remember, we had weathering and erosion, transportation. And by sedimentation here, that's the combination of both deposition and post-depositional changes. And one particular small spot of the Earth can go from E-world to D-world pretty quickly. This is Shell Creek in Wyoming, upstream in the Bighorn Mountains, it's definitely E-world. The uh, Shell Creek is tearing apart the rocks, slowly but surely, breaking them into fragments and transporting them along. But you come out of the mountains, 
about you know, 10 miles as a raven flies, uh, somewhat longer as the van drives. And we're accumulating new sediment. This what's called a point bar here, this, this mass of sediment, and indeed all the sediment down there, those were bits of the mountain that have been transported out and are now piling up. Now, as the sediment is being transported along, it's being modified. One form of modification is it's getting rounder. The edges are getting knocked off. So the longer it gets transported, the rounder it becomes. So if you find a rock that's got lots of little round particles in it, that means it had a longer distance of transport. If you find a lot of angular fragments, that tells us it was a shorter distance of transport. That's why that distinction between breccias and conglomerates are important. Breccias, remember, gravel stones with big angular chunks? They barely moved from their host rock. They all have their big angles on it, their big edges. You roll it around for just a little bit, you begin to knock off those edges, you round them out, and you get a conglomerate. Another aspect of transport is the degree of sorting. In short distances of transport, you, nature doesn't have time to really winnow out the fine particles from the medium-sized particles to the large-sized particles. So you get lots of different particle sizes together. But the longer you transport it, the more you settle, you settle out the heaviest particles first, and then the larger medium, and then the medium medium, and then the light medium, and it gets better, better sorted. We call this also a immature versus mature sediment, is another way to call this. So here's a poorly sorted sand and a well sorted sand. Compositionally, in terms of the, the sediment particles, almost identical, but the maturity or the sorting of it is very different. So, close to the source, poorly sorted. So here are great big chunks and smaller chunks and tiny chunks in between. Far from the source, almost all the particles are the same size. This is a beach sand in what's well, now the Appalachian Mountains, but back in the Devonian, um, it would have been a beach. Now, once the sediment is settling down, stuff can happen to it. And it generates things that we call, very creatively, sedimentary structures. So these are features that are imposed onto the sediment before it's rock. Right here, for instance, you see this is not a sedimentary rock. This is just mud. But you see raindrop marks, the little divots. And you see mud cracks. And both of those tell us two different things. And they can preserve. This is ancient mud cracks. Well, what happens actually is the mud was subjected to drying, so we know it wasn't entirely underwater. It was exposed to the air. As it exposed to the air, it shrank a bit and formed the cracks in between. And then another layer of sediment came on top of it. It filled in those spaces, and it preserved those cracks. So this tells us this mud was not continuously underwater. It was exposed to air. Raindrop marks, and here are ancient raindrop marks, they tell us that that sediment had to have been exposed to air or at most under a thin film of water. Because you go out into nature and you watch, and rain doesn't like penetrate down feet into the water. It can only imprint if the mud is really close to the size of basically the size of the raindrop itself. So this has to have been exposed. That tells us information we might not have known before. Another type of sedimentary structure are ripple marks. So when water is, well, sorry, when sediment is in moving water, particularly sand or silt, it's going to get moved either in one direction or back and forth. If it's moved back and forth by oscillation, that is by waves, like on the shoreline of a beach, of a, you know, it could be a lake or the ocean or a bay or whatever, it gets moved one way, and then it gets moved back the first way, and then back the first way again, and back and forth. And you get ripple marks that are symmetrical. They're bi-directional. So those are beach deposits. But if you're in a channel, like a stream, and by stream we mean anything from a giant river to a little creek, 
Or maybe if you happen to be in an environment where the wind only blows one way, that's sort of rare. <laughs> then you'll get unidirectional or current ripples. And those will always be gentle up current and steeper down current. And will tell you what direction the stream was flowing at the time they formed. The reason for this, what's happening is the individual grains of sand are being rolled up this and then they fall down the cliff face. And then each of these ripples is really actually running up the next ripple downstream. So here is a ripple mark surface, a bi-directional beach ripple mark surface. I actually took this photo at um, Bayfront Park near Chesapeake Beach. And here is an ancient beach deposit. And just to point out, that three lobe structure there, that's the footprint of a dinosaur. And there's its next track and sequence. So this is a beach that a dinosaur was walking along. Now, sometimes you don't see the top surface. Instead, you see the ripples from the side. And what they produce are what we call cross beds. So called because the, there are little beds that cut across the main strata or bed. And they always indicate the, down, the, the downstream direction. They're filling in the spots downstream. So you see the wind or, or current is transporting them, and then they have a little slip down that side, and they aim in the direction that the current was moving. And if you find, as you see here at the bottom, the stream was traveling one, or the current was traveling one direction once, and then later on, it happens to be traveling maybe a totally different stream or maybe it's wind, a totally different direction. And we can see that reflected in the direction of the ripple marks or the cross beds. And here's a real world example, a series of cross beds. And you see they're all dipping in the same general sense. So the current was always going in that same general direction. So we can, 150 million years later, tell what direction the stream was moving at this spot. Yes? What exactly would alter the direction of the stream? Okay, so the question is what might alter the direction of the stream? I'll get to that in a bit. I thought the slide was right here, but it, I got it out of sequence. And that is, you might hit the streams themselves move. So, uh, but there's another sort of cross bed, which is generated by wind. And winds very rarely always go in the same direction. So they'll be creating a current ripple, but then the winds will shift. And they'll gouge into the old current, the, the, sorry, the old cross beds, the old uh, ripple marks, and start depositing new ones. And so the shifting pattern produces what we call trough cross beds. A trough, like, like a feeding trough. Stuff is gouged out and redeposited in there. And they are typical of deserts, you know, deserts with big sand dunes, or big beach dunes. Like the sort of beach that most of us like to go to if we like to go to a beach, a uh, sandy beach with those huge dunes, if you were to cr cut them in cross-section, you would see trough cross beds. And we can see them ancient forms. So here's an ancient cross bed. Trough cross bed, I should say. So briefly, which of these two sediments do you think was deposited in a quieter, that is, lower energy environment? Who thinks that A was quieter or lower energy? Okay, who thinks that B is quieter or lower energy? For those who argue A, what evidence were you looking at? Go for it. I mean, I see lots of words like Morris and B, which that's fine. Ah, okay. That, um, this is not directly at the side. Okay. I'm looking at it sort of obliquely. If I looked at the side, all those layers would be really flat. Okay. So given that information, does anyone want to change their vote? <laughs> who votes for A? Who votes for B? Okay, the answer is B was in the quieter environment. And one of the main ways you can tell, you can actually see the particles there, the big sand particles. You can't see the particles here. The individual layers are formed of mud. And all the layers are a little uh, flat. If I, you're right, I should have shown this as a just oblique view, a straight on view. I am sorry that I thought I had the picture of the, um, of the moving stream. Actually, that's right, I moved it into a, a, later, it's a later section. Just briefly, streams move 
in meanders back and forth. So any given spot might have the stream going one way, and as the, the whole stream structure moves downhill, then the meander going the other direction will deposit on top of it. We will get to that eventually. But what I've talked about so far, we've still just had the rocks as sediments. They're not rocks yet. Remember, we need a naturally occurring cohesive solid. These aren't solids yet. They're not, well, no, they're, they're not cohesive. So we need to change it into something that's cohesive. That process is called lithification, which is kind of a cheat, because that word just means turning to stone. So lithification, what is that? It involves a combination of at least one, if not two or three, different processes. These include compaction. As sediment is deposited on top of sediment, as deposited on top of sediment, it will get more compacted. Now, in sand, that won't actually, or, or, or gravel, that's not going to turn into the stone, or even silt. But clay, that process actually squeezes the stuff together. It squeezes the water out, and it tends to become actually um, cohesive. Then there's recrystallization. And some of you who are paying attention, Dr. Holtz, isn't recrystallization the pathway to metamorphic rocks? And I'll say, thank you for paying attention, but. <laughs> In this case, we're talking about recrystallization only where the two grains of sediment touch each other. So you might think it's a tiny, tiny, super, super microscopic um, metamorphic rock in the whole mass. So what happens is as it's being compressed down, those two things grow into each other and they stick together. And one of the most common ways, though, is cementation. The sediments have accumulated, water is percolating through the ground. Geologists have a highly complicated term for that. It's called groundwater. And that groundwater has got dissolved minerals in it. And some of those dissolved minerals will begin to precipitate around in the void spaces between the grains of sediment. And as they precipitate, they grow into each other. And they, they stick the particles together. Collectively, we call these parts, these different uh, aspects of lithification, diagenesis, which is the post-depositional alteration of sediment. Now, I'm looking at the time, and so we will pick up in the next lecture with the depositional environments, because that will segue directly into the issues of fossil and fossilization. Um, because it's all interconnected. So, see you later, um, and remember to watch, if you haven't already, the Panopto that are recorded on Friday.